We're going to talk about why are we so worried about the future. We just seen a presentation about trends, but we're increasingly getting worried about the future and the uncertainty that that brings. So let's get the party started. I like to call this a party. And let's talk about ethics. And we're going to start exploring in a simple way what ethics is. Because when we go and meet managers of companies or country heads, the definition of ethics is very diverse and different. And I'm going to see and I'm going to show you why. So has anyone in this audience killed someone or killed something? And you would probably say, can you raise your hands? Have you killed? I have killed. Please, more hands. The reality is, yes, we have all killed. At some point in our lives, it might have been an ant, it might have been a fly. But we have done that. We've killed, which is probably the last bastion of ethical dilemmas. And we killed because it was easy. So try and kill this thing without any weapons. You'll find it very difficult. But he's going to find it very easy, and he's not going to kill you because of money. He's going, he wants to eat you. So his ethics are better than ours at some point. And he's an animal, right? Now, depending on what religion you believe in, you have different perceptions of what happens after you die. But some of these religions, like Buddhism, thinks that that ant that you just killed or the fly that you just destroyed could be you in the future. Because they believe reincarnation can come from anything. And therefore, you, they have a different belief and an aspect of looking at life. So let's have a look basically at what I'm talking about. And I'm talking about something that sometimes we forget. And it's about how we govern our own lives, how companies govern their people, how they make decisions, sometimes good decisions, sometimes bad decisions. And most importantly, it's not just about saving jobs, but it's about saving lives. Somebody said that the only new thing in this world is the history you don't know. Because history repeats itself. And when you look at something that happened, you realize, hell, I've seen that happen 100, 200, 1,000 years ago, and it's happening again. We can see now another aspect of history. We can see how history dictates still a lot of our values today, in this country, for example, and in many other countries. And we, can, we have here an example of Turkey's outlook towards the European Union. I believe Turkey should join the EU, and I think they should join as soon as possible. But other people in Europe have different perceptions than I have. They might not have come here. They might see it as a threat. I do believe the sooner the better, because I see it an opportunity, a strategic opportunity. But history is driving a lot of the decisions up there in Europe about what, why Turkey should or should not come in. And as uh, someone said, it takes 20 years to build a reputation, and in five minutes you can destroy that reputation. So many cases like Enron have shown how a, a group of Harvard-educated MBAs with distinctive careers can get to a position of not recognizing anymore whether they're going through a red light or a yellow light or a green light. And that's what's been happening in some corporations. Because the line is very diffused. It's not a clear line. Now, who do you trust? We had a horrible killing in Virginia Tech done by this, what I call a poor guy who had not received help from his student friends, his professors, his family. He was a loner. Nobody knew what he had in his mind. But everybody trusted the guy. One morning, he does the killings. And the next day, and how ethical is this, two of the top newspapers in North America buy from Google keywords about killing in Virginia Tech to get traffic. Is that ethical? Would you do it to get more traffic to your site using somebody's death? And they were attacked by most of the media by buying those keywords of killings in Virginia Tech. And they stopped doing it. So all of a sudden, the world decided that, hey, governance is an important thing. 
Corruption is not right. Well, it's still right maybe if nobody finds out. It's just a friend. And all of a sudden, we have big corporations collapsing because they can't tell the difference. We had them in Italy. We had them in Spain. We had them in Germany, Sweden. We have them everywhere. So it's not a cultural thing. We can't say, oh, Northern Europe is very ethical, and they don't do anything. There's no corruption there. It's only down there. No, it's everywhere. Nobody, it's only a question of who gets found out. This is an interesting piece of, of research. It's about who do we trust? Who does the public trust? Uh, it's a piece of research. And it's basically, uh, what I found interesting from this is that corporations today are one of the least trusted organizations out there. So the image changed because before corporations were much higher up the list of, cor of trusted organizations. And the media has always been right there in the middle. And we can see now that those companies have to do a lot of work now to be trusted again. It's a good thing about the internet, I say, because now you can research a name and find out a lot of things. If you put my name or if you put your name, you might find interesting things. So from that respect, it's a good thing. The other good thing is that there is a lot of people that are putting a lot of pressure on companies, on organizations to do better and actually they now know that somebody's watching my actions. I don't know if you have a lot of blogging going on in Turkey, but in the rest of the world, every country now, mostly in North America and mostly in Europe, every company kind of has a blogger following that company and is the communications manager's worst nightmare. Because it means that you have to be really, really careful about every action or this blogger will do something. And some of these guys are bringing the companies really down. They're exposing them. And thank God for that, because we're finding out that some of these companies we believe in and respect are doing really a bad job. Let's look at some of the pressure groups that are looking at, all of a sudden, because this sounds like we didn't know about this before. Well, we didn't know smoking was really bad. The same things with the food that we eat every day. This is an interesting article I read about the two CEOs of McDonald's apparently died of by eating hamburgers, McDonald's hamburgers. So you're starting to think, is, is this a fake article or a spook or, or something? I mean, it can't be true. Most of their diet consisted of hamburgers from McDonald's because obviously they were promoting the product. Then you had this revolution with documentaries like Super Size Me and other movies. Mac libel about exposing the, the things that these corporations are doing and, and basically saying start worrying about what you're eating because it changes the way you in fact also behave. Now an interesting thing about governance is that a company might have more than one actor in a chain that can bring the company down. In this case it was very interesting. McDonald's has a website if you go to it you can read a lot about governance and about how ethical they are and about but they don't tell you where they buy their tomato ketchup from. And the thing is, they didn't ask the tomato ketchup manufacturer who picks up the tomatoes that they use in their ketchup. That's an interesting thing. Who are they? Where are they? We don't know. I don't know. I didn't know. In fact, the guys who were picking up tomatoes decided one day, they went to an internet cafe and they said, you know, this is illegal. We're being paid by this. Uh, it's not McDonald's who employs these people, but they're saying our tomato goes to McDonald's who makes a lot of money selling this hamburger. So they decided to create a campaign. These are Indians picking up tomatoes in places like Florida and North America. They decided to expose the fact that they're getting paid less than the average legal rate by picking up these tomatoes. So they went straight to McDonald's and said, look, there's a lot of suppliers. There's somebody who I pick up the tomatoes from and he sells the tomatoes to uh, a distributor and the distributor sells it through and it ends up in your stores do something about it and McDonald's put pressure on the chain to give these guys above the minimum rate per hour I think that's a good thing but it's a little guy who can who can do that now so we say that most of the time is pure common sense again we have at the top of corporations very seasoned executives making these decisions 
And apparently one of the biggest disasters, this is again recent, in uh, North America was in one of the British petroleum plants. And when you ask about security measures at that plant, you were told, hey, this place was hanging like with strings, with what they call band-aids. And we kept saying to the management, we need to invest in safety. This is one of the biggest plans of refining for British Petroleum in North America. This is worth billions, guys. They didn't listen. And they made one of the biggest disasters, industrial disasters in North America. And they followed two mistakes. It's what we call the two laws of assumption and prevention. In many cases, you ask actually after the disaster and you say, well, what happened is nobody assumed Yes, I thought somebody in my company was taking care of that problem, but nobody had taken care of that problem. Nobody even thought about it. So it's this assumption that in your company, someone is actually doing something that nobody's actually said, I am doing it. And the prevention one is the one I like the most, is that sometimes a five pound investment can save 20, 30 million pounds from a lawsuit. And this is an interesting case in litigation. Tourists, some tourists died due to the fact they died from carbon monoxide poisoning in a tourist resort in the south of, I can't say it for legal reasons where or who it is, but just five pounds would have saved the lives of this family and also saved millions in litigation. Nobody prevented the, the problem. So, but let's, let's look at this case because, yes, the phone calls were made and, we, and they said, look, we just picked up this horrific submarine earthquake in the Indian Ocean. This means there's a tsunami at some point. But nobody in Thailand, nobody in India could see the tsunami. So they were wondering, well, maybe there is a tsunami. Maybe there isn't a tsunami. You know, if we give a warning, we might lose a lot of tourists. We might upset a lot of people. You know what it means to give a tsunami warning? It means we got to relocate people. And they didn't. Due to commercial reasons, a lot of the meteorologists said, well, this, you know, what if I'm wrong? I'm going to get fired. Can you show me there's a tsunami? No, we don't have the system. They didn't make the calls. They did not do it, and it was one of the biggest natural disasters ever. I think it's tragic. And I work for many airlines, and I tell you, they're not very innovative. They're really, really careful about analyzing cost, and they're very careful about trying to be competitive and having the right routes. But I think the decision of giving up the Concorde was a bad decision. So I use this uh, analogy to show that some people are actually now thinking, this is Richard Branson, that we should actually forget the Concorde. We should go to space. Con so you have a company deciding that the future of travel is not going to be fast travel, more routes, better service, and we have other innovators thinking, let's take these guys into space. You see the difference in thinking and beliefs and values. So we can see that you can predict, you can think about predicting and predicting and, and thinking, well, let's predict, or you can actually dream. And dreams are not about accountability. You don't have to say, that, oh, that dream is right or that dream is wrong. It's just a dream but I'm going to follow that dream. And I might be completely wrong, but it's my dream. And that's what many big companies have been based on, on the dream. This is their garage. This is where Google was started, basically. They're renting it from the lady. They were renting it for peanuts from the lady. Now they bought the house because they believe that's a, sh a shrine. So this woman made a lot of money by selling Google the house with the garage where they started. So why do we talk about garages? And I hope there's a lot of garages in your life because a lot of big companies started in a garage. They didn't start in a big building with glass windows. They started in a garage. This is Steve Jobs' garage. This is Walt Disney's garage. This is Hewlett Packard's garage. And yes, even Google started only 10 years ago in a garage. I don't know if Bill Gates has a garage, but I guess his Albuquerque office could be defined as a garage. Now, do you have a garage? Because it's not about, oh, I don't have this, I don't have that, oh, I have to buy that company to do this, or do you, do you have that dream and do you have that garage? Because you can make it with that dream and the garage.
They've done it. Google's done it. So it's not about, oh, this guy did it, oh, he was 1940-something. Oh, today's different. No. Those guys started in a garage. I love the garage. Another interesting company, it's, uh, and I recommend for you, uh, if you have children, to use this book for educational purposes. Okay, how can we change people's habits? And we say, they say, change the world nine to five in the things you do from when you wake up to going back home. And they give all, all sorts of tips on things you can do while you're working, while you're printing, while you're emailing, while you're drinking coffee, while you're going to a meeting, on how you can change that world. I recommend you buy this. It's available on Amazon.com. Now, supermarkets. This is interesting. If you go to some supermarkets in England, you will find a big pile of packaging lying outside a supermarket like rubbish, like there's been a strike. It's the supermarket who's actually piled up all the packaging they believe to expose their own suppliers of products to expose the packaging they believe is unnecessary. So consumers can go there and put the packaging they believe is. There is too much packaging. Do I really need so much for four oranges? Do I need to have this wrapping and this poly, polyfoam? They're putting it outside because you, see, you can see the, in the example of the little chip card, which uses a massive amount of packaging for a little piece. This is, again, now a war. The war on packaging has started. It's not just about recycling. It's about not having to recycle. These are concepts that are becoming very important. A concept such as externalities, which is not about how much, how much that this bottle cost. Basically, is the cost of this bottle the real cost? What is the impact of the cost of this bottle later when I dumped it? So these are some of the concepts that, or choice editing, where instead of having 20 washing machines to choose from, I only choose the three that are, are going to do the most efficient washing. And ethical growth. Let's say we're in a meeting in a boardroom and thinking, guys, we've got to grow this company. Hey, let's, let's do some brand extensions here, and let's see what we can do to, to fight our competition. This time, the discussion is not just about brand extending, but what can we do new that not only is going to make us grow, but is going to make us more sustainable. So smart brands are embracing sustainability. They're embracing that concept, but in their culture, it's not just about saying, well, I, hey, I'm green now. It's about changing the processes, the marketing strategies, the product development meetings to adapt to that new reality. Why are brands important in this process? Because we know that when we ask people about what they know, they only know or can identify up to 10 plants, but they know thousands of brands. So brands can be the enabler of that change profitably because you will not lose money if you do it right. In fact, companies are making more money. General Electric has now realized that their profits due to their sustainable strategies in developing efficiencies internally are paying off. We talked about our beliefs before and our, well, who do we trust? Do we trust this brand? Don't we trust this brand? What is it doing so that I can trust it? So we're realizing now that, yes, Emotional aspects are now becoming more important than the functional attributes that you might find buying products like a washing machine. That might be cheaper or might be five-year warranty. This one is three years warranty instead or two years, but it's more efficient, it's more ecological. I'm going to go for that. This is what's happening today. It's changing people's beliefs and attitudes. I don't know if you know Patagonia or use Patagonia. I do. It's one of the best examples I always use. But the things I really like to show from Patagonia is not their products. Patagonia was the forerunner in creating that little thing that you see at the bottom, right here. That thing is one of the things that defines the culture of Patagonia. And it's called 1% for the Earth. Patagonia donates 1% 
of their profits to the environment. And they've created this group of companies that are getting more and more every day that do go to this website. They input their sales, they input their costs, they look at their profits, and they decide, and there's already 200 of them, I'm going to donate 1% of my sales to this foundation that will actually save the earth, that will do projects for the earth. Not many companies, there's not many corporations in here. They could, they're the ones that could afford it, they're not there. But there's a lot of medium-sized, small companies donating. That's a big sign. Most of the pens we're carrying are not biodegradable or recyclable, some of them. We heard before about fur trade. Now, fur trade, we might think, oh, fur trade is charity. Fair trade is big business. 20% of all retail food sales in the UK are fair trade. I want to end with this example of a car company. Toyota is one of the best. In fact, Toyota is destroying the American car companies. It's an American company as well, of course, but they're winning. And they have a big vision. They have this big vision of zero accidents, and they have a research lab constantly working 365, seven days a week, on how to reduce accidents to zero. That's their vision. Be responsible and join the revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.